To introduce our speaker, we have a member of our uh, local business chapter, Mr. Charles Casey. And while he's doing that, if you would check your cell phones and make sure they're on silence, we, we would appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Casey. Well, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker this morning. We met for the first time on the elevator, but I know that he is not a stranger to many of you as he's been in this area uh, two or three times already. Uh, he is founder and president of the American Policy Center, which focuses on the preservation of the rights of United States citizens under our Constitution. For over 30 years, he has been a businessman, a grassroots activist, a writer, and publisher. And among the things that he has championed are, are private property rights and privacy rights. And these are among the things that qualify him to speak to us about Agenda 21 and sustainable development. Agenda 21 and sustainable, sustainable development are already driving decisions at the community uh, level. And those of us that live in Dallas and Plano and Richardson and, and several of the, of the DFW areas are already being affected by that. Unfortunately, our community leaders are not aware of it. They're ignorant of, of what is really going on. Tom DeWeese is here as our guest today to inform us uh, about Radical Agenda 21 uh, and what we can do as informed citizens to protect ourselves from one of the greatest threats of our generation. I encourage you to take notes because you'll need those notes if you try to address uh, any of your local uh, uh, politicians. Please help me welcome Tom Bruce. Thank you. I um, want to warn you about taking those notes. I talk fast and I apologize, but there's so much information to get out that it's uh, difficult to, uh, to take it slow. Um, meetings like this are taking place across the country, hundreds of them. People are beginning to understand uh, about Agenda 21. Uh, you may have heard of it, you may not have heard of it, you may know about it, you may not know about it. What I'm going to do today in the next hour is I'm going to go through it uh, very fast, but as thoroughly as I possibly can, so that you can uh, get the gist of it and understand it and, and walk out of this room and join the revolution to stop Agenda 21. But let me, let me just start by saying this. Property, liberty, and the rule of law. These are the founding principles of the United States of America. And we hear these words, yet many Americans fail to understand their meaning or how they affect our everyday lives. Our founding fathers warned us that eternal vigilance was necessary in order to protect our liberties. They have been ignored, and life in America has begun to change. You all know that something is very wrong in America. Every day, government at every level gets more out of control, more intrusive in our personal lives, more of a threat to our private property, all in total and flagrant disregard of the expressed will of the people. The fact is, Americans have grown to fear our own government. Life is getting harder. There is less optimism about the future. You know, the once prominent phrase, American dream, seems to have been dropped from our vocabulary. The reason? America is going through what Al Gore called a wrenching transformation of our society. Well, what kind of transformation? What has changed? Where does this transformation originate? How does it directly affect your everyday life? Well, the old structure of what was once the United States of America is being replaced with a new political and economic order that is drastically changing the very underpinnings of our nation. It is being done quietly, behind the scenes, without debates, without votes, and with no formal uh, announcement. Yet this new ruling authority has become the official policy of the federal government, every state government, and nearly every city, town, and burg in the country. The ruling authority is called sustainable development. And its blueprint 
for transforming human existence is fully outlined in a UN document called Agenda 21. I've had over 20 years of experience studying every aspect of sustainable development in Agenda 21, and I've learned that it is an absolute threat to everything free Americans hold dear. Here's what I know. Over the past 20 years, a strange new language began to overtake our government. Today, a typical city council meeting discusses comprehensive development, density, historic preservation, and partnerships between the city and private, or private companies. Civic leaders organize community meetings run by facilitators as they outline a vision for the town that is ultimately enforced by something called consensus. Wetlands, conservation easements, watersheds, viewsheds, rails to trails, biosphere reserves, greenways, carbon footprints, partnerships, preservation, stakeholders, land use, environmental protection, development, diversity, visioning, open space, heritage areas, comprehensive planning, critical thinking, and even community service have all become part of this new language. <clears throat> what are they really talking about? Where was such language first developed? Well, the term sustainable development was born on the pages of a United Nations document called Our Common Future. This was the official report of the 1987 UN World Commission on Environment and Development. As a result of this report, for the first time, the use of environmental protection and human development were tied to the age-old socialist goals of international redistribution of wealth. And that is the key to understanding the true purpose of sustainable development and all of its policies, control of all facets of the economy. And just to make it very interesting, here is how the UN described Agenda 21 in one of its own publications in 1993. It said, quote, Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on Earth. It calls for specific changes in the activities of all people. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require, will require a profound reorientation of all humans unlike anything the world has ever experienced." End quote. Have you ever heard a more powerful manifesto issued for the purpose of government? And yet, when you and I point this out and protest against it, we are attacked as fringe radicals. Never heard of it, doesn't exist, you're all crazy. Well, here is the exact course that brought Agenda 21 to America and into your local community. And before I'm done today, I'll go through this three times because it is absolutely necessary for you to understand this process as they continue to deny that local planning boards have nothing to do with Agenda 21. At the top of the infrastructure, Pushing sustainable development is the United Nations Environmental Program, or the UNEP. But the UNEP doesn't operate on its own. Influencing it are thousands of non-governmental organizations, or NGOs. Remember that term, NGOs. These are private groups which seek to implement a special political agenda. And through the UN infrastructure, particularly through the UNEP, they have great power. NGOs aren't just groups that just pop up somewhere and say, oh, we're an NGO. They are sanctioned by the United Nations after they fill out an application that's about that thick, and they get approved to work in these international meetings and behind the scenes. And prior to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, these sanctioned NGOs spent considerable time writing and creating the document that would be introduced to the world as Agenda 21. At the Earth Summit, 172 heads of state signed agreement to Agenda 21, including President George H.W. Bush. 
Agenda 21 is not a treaty that has to be ratified by the Senate. Rather, it's what's known as a soft law policy, a guideline that the nation agrees to implement through its own legislative process. And this is what our critics point to constantly. Agenda 21 is just an idea. There's no rule of law here. There are no blue helmeted soldiers over in City Hall. There's no enforcement. It's all a voluntary thing. But while opponents of Agenda 21 use that fact to dismiss our concerns, claiming it's just a voluntary suggestion, that is far from the truth. Step by step, their suggestions have become the force of government. President Bush, in signing the document, committed the U.S. to implement the policies of, the, of Agenda 21. Agenda 21 then gained huge momentum when in 1993, President Bill Clinton signed Executive Order 12852 to create the President's Council on Sustainable Development and he made it official U.S. policy. Take a look at who served on that council and you will see many of the same NGOs which helped write Agenda 21 at the UN level, now openly serving on the, on the President's Council of Sustainable Development. They include Jonathan Lash of the World Resources Institute, one of the three most powerful organizations influencing the UNEP on the President's Council. Also on the President's Council were John Sawhill of the Nature Conservancy, and Jay Hare of the National Wildlife Federation, and Michelle Peralt, the uh, International Vice President of the Sierra Club. All players in the creation of Agenda 21 now openly serving on the President's Council with the specific mission of implementing Agenda 21 into American policy. And there is an even more direct route between Agenda 21 and our federal government. Included at the UNEP table to develop policy, to discuss it and bring it home to implement it, along with all of those NGO groups who helped write it, are these players from our federal government. They include representatives from the Department of State, the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service. These agencies send representatives to all UNEP meetings. Now, why do they do that if Agenda 21 is just a myth that has no effect on our government? The fact is, of course, it does. You might remember a great deal of discussion during the Clinton administration about the idea of a reinventing of government. Now, some people actually thought this meant that the government finally figured it out and they needed to adhere to the Constitution to reinvent how government was run. Well, Vice President Al Gore was put in charge of that reinvention, so that should have been our first clue. The reinvention, of course, was sustainable development. The purpose of the President's Council was to translate the guidelines of Agenda 21 into public policy to be administered by the federal government. And that step-by-step -step process translated into the ruling authority through which a UN plan, Agenda 21, has become unquestioned U.S. policy throughout the nation. Sustainable development is not a local idea or local policy, no matter how many times your local elected officials tell you that. The idea, the process, the agenda came from this process. So, what is sustainable development? Well, one hint, it is not environmental policy. Sustainable development is about a planned central economy and redistribution of wealth on a local, state, national, and international level. The process by which it is implemented creates a matrix of locked away land or severe land use controls, control of energy and energy production, control of transportation, control of industry, control of food production, control of development, control of water, and its availability and control of population size and growth. But of course, most of these policies and regulations are issued under the excuse of environmental protection. Agenda 21 is not just policy. It is a complete system to change the way we think 
the way we react, the way we make decisions. And those who promote it have a very specific answer for how you are to do each of those things. That's why they call it an agenda. Let me show you what I mean. The logo for sustainable development that's used in all of their literature contains three connecting circles. Each one is labeled. One is labeled social equity, one is labeled economic prosperity, and one is labeled ecological integrity. These three things encompass every aspect of human life. Let me take them one at a time. And I will, let me take social equity first. I'll tell you straight out. If you fail to grasp the social equity aspect of sustainable development, if you continue to think this is about conservation and environmental protection and just a common sense way to do development in our community, then you simply have no grasp of this issue, period. Social equity is based on a demand for social justice. This is a term that we now hear over and over again in public meetings, even in courtrooms. Social justice. Social equity and social justice require that the world's wealth be shared between those who produce and those who don't. It is every welfare program and wealth redistribution scheme ever proposed. Redistribution of wealth, by the way, means everyone is equally poor, not equally rich. It means no one can move forward unless everyone can move forward together. A utopian myth that cannot be achieved through government edicts. And by the way, Karl Marx was the first to coin the phrase social justice. Do I need to say any more? Barack Obama, in his recent State of the Union message back in January, the entire speech was based on social justice. When he called for economic fairness, he really meant redistribution of wealth, disdainfully attacking tax cuts for the wealthy. That's you, by the way. The sustainable system is based on the principle that individuals must give up selfish wants for the needs of the common good or the community. Whenever you hear them talking about the community, that's what they mean, the common good. The common good, there's no room for individuals. According to the sustainables, it is a social injustice for some to have prosperity if others do not. Profits, they say, are made at the expense of people. In short, social equity and through sustainable development is a means to a forced utopia with promises of health care for all, jobs for all, housing for all, and equality for all. It's a goombaya hug. Agenda 21 means the individual is subservient to the needs of the greater good of society, and that's what they mean every time, as I said, every time local legislators talk about the community. The second E, economic prosperity. At the root of Agenda 21, uh, economics, are public-private partnerships. Keep that term in your mind, public-private partnerships. They pull together into a government-driven economy called corporatism. It is not capitalism or free markets, though it may have some of the trappings. The marketplace is still there, but ultimately, corporatism does not trust the marketplace to do what the elites want done. The partnerships allow for special tax breaks, access to land for some developers, but not for others, non-compete clauses in government projects that guarantee profits, access to grants and lucrative special government projects, and much more. Under public-private partnerships, there is a guarantee of protection and what they call profits. The Texas, Trans-Texas Corridor was a public-private partnership full of non-compete clauses and guarantees of profits. Corporations that play ball get the power of government, and government gets to hide behind the independence of, of private business. Thus, the partnerships between corporations and government is done at the expense of ordinary people. The exact opposite effect of free markets controlled by consumers. There's a new business, a new way that business is being run in America <laughs> under sustainable development. The business plan of the day, lobby for regulations. 
They argue that it's good for the economy, creating jobs by destroying things from the past. They say it's good for the economy uh, to enforce regulations, to make people buy things they didn't need before. Well, it's certainly not free enterprise or open markets. The true description is government-sanctioned monopolies right out of the Mussolini fascist playbook. And the third E, ecological integrity. Well, that's just the excuse for all of it, isn't it? Sustainableist policy interprets any action man takes as a direct threat to the environment. Sustainableists contend that humans only defile nature. And only a strong, central, all-powerful government can protect the environment. Individuals and limited government can't be trusted because man is nothing more than a swarm of locusts that swoops down on nature and sucks it dry till there's nothing left. Nothing good comes from man, according to sustainableist doctrine. And private property ownership and control is a main target of sustainable development. Consider this quote from the report of the 1976 UN Habitat I conference, one of the precursors to the UN uh, Earth Summit in 92. In, the, uh, in this document, it said this about land. Quote, land cannot be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private land ownership is also a principal instrument of accumulation and concentration of wealth and therefore contributes to social justice. So when you gain equity on your home, you are contributing to social injustice because you're getting some wealth from that. What a horrible concept and we've got to stop it. The fact is, Agenda 21 is a blueprint to completely change our society to a top-down planned central economy in a strange mixture of socialism, fascism, and corporatism. To convince Americans to accept it required something that would get us to sacrifice our natural rights voluntarily. The answer? Environmental Armageddon. You must sacrifice freedom to protect the planet. It's urgent, we're told. Consider this quote by Alexander King in the Club of Rome. He said, quote, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like, would fit the bill. All of these dangers are caused by human intervention. The real enemy then is humanity." End quote. So, the urgency is on. Global warming is feeding the hysteria. There's no time to consider things like individual concerns and wants and needs. Selfish cries of sustainableness. We must save the environment. Go green. Get out of your cars. Stop using energy. Sacrifice. Cut your carbon footprint or perish. And so, federal and state governments, working hand in hand with a horde of non-government organizations, private groups with personal political agendas, force passage of rules and regulations passed down to local communities. But, say your local officials, None of that UN socialist stuff is true. Just conspiracy theories with the right-wing radicals. We're just treating the, uh, just creating the tools necessary in a local effort to manage growth and development for our community, they say. Have you heard these denials? And consider this quote by J. Gary Lawrence, a planner for the city of Seattle and an advisor to the President's Council on Sustainable Development. He said, quote, Participating in a UN-advocated planning process would very likely bring out many who would actively work to defeat any elected official undertaking Local Agenda 21. So, we will call our process something else, such as comprehensive planning, growth management, or smart growth. End quote. Local indeed. The fact is, this is a political movement led by those who seek to control the world economy, dictate development, and redistribute the world's wealth. They use the philosophical base of Karl Marx, the tactics of Adolf Hitler, and the rhetoric of the Sierra Club. Everything connected with sustainable development translates to higher costs, 
shortages, and sacrifice. And the best way to understand what sustainable development actually is, is found by discovering what they consider to be not sustainable. Maurice Strong, the Secretary General of the Earth Summit in 1992 said, quote, current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class, you again, involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. You get that? That means your home, your private home on private property is not sustainable. Your barbecue out in the backyard is not sustainable. Getting cool in the summertime or warm in the wintertime is not sustainable. So, how is this wrenching transformation being put into place? There are four very specific routes being used. In the rural areas, it's called the Wildlands Project. In the cities, it's called smart growth. In business, it's called public-private partnerships. And in government, it's called stakeholder councils and non-elected boards and regional governments or reinvented government. Let me take them one at a time. First, the Wildlands Project was the brainchild of Earth First Dave Foreman, one of the most radical environmental groups ever to show its head in the public world. And it literally calls for the rewilding of 50% of all the land in every state back to the way it was before Christopher Columbus came here. In 1983, when Foreman first dreamed up the scheme for the Wildlands Project, he said this, quote, It is not enough to preserve the roadless, undeveloped country remaining. We must recreate wilderness in large regions, move out the cars and civilized people, dismantle the roads and the dams, reclaim the plowed lands and clear cuts, and reintroduce extirpated species. That's basically the headlines on every single newspaper in this country every day. They're tearing down the, the dams, they're tearing up the roads, they're not building new roads, and they're not allowing development in places across the country. Destruction of human civilization was his goal. In reality, the Wildlands Project is a diabolical plan to herd people off the rural lands and into, the human, into human settlements or our cities and our towns. From the demented mind of Dave Foreman, the plan became a blueprint for the UN's Biodiversity Treaty. So now the scheme is international in scope with the power of law. Thomas Lovejoy, a science advisor to the Federal Department of Interior, said this, quote, we will map the whole nation, determine development for the whole country, and regulate it. Land of the brave and home of the free. And your local elected officials are helping to implement this insanity. And yet they are quick to deny that these such ideas have their origins at an international level. And they accuse me of wearing a tinfoil hat and hearing voices. Well, here's a voice I hear. Once again, Maurice Strong said at the UN's Earth Summit, quote, isn't the only hope for the planet that the industrialized nations collapse? Isn't it our responsibility to bring that about? And that is the true agenda that we face. But how do you remove people from the land? Well, there's many tools in place to stop human activity and grow the wilderness. Here's a few. Deny grazing and water rights on public lands. There are, uh, it becomes more difficult and more expensive to run the farm or the ranch, and eventually it'll go out of business and the land reverts to wilderness. Lock away natural resources by creating more national parks. It shuts down the mines, and they go, back, go, go out of business, and it goes back to wilderness. Call every mosquito-infested swamp and occasional mud puddle a wetlands, and ban any development around it. Invent a spotted owl shortage and pretend it can't live in a forest where timber is cut. Shut off the forest. Then when no trees are cut, there's nothing to feed the mills, and then there are no jobs, and they go out of business, and in fact, whole towns die. And it goes back 
to wilderness. The governor of Maryland is enforcing an, an agenda without a vote by the legislature, by the way, executive order, called Plan Maryland that will lock away over 400,000 acres of land, banned from any development. One of the key provisions is a policy to ban septic tanks as a means to protect the Chesapeake Bay, even though there is no evidence that septic tanks do any damage whatsoever. The only result of that ban will be to make it impossible to live in a rural area. Getting people off the rural lands and into the cities is the real purpose, not environmental protection. The Wildlands Project comes in many names and many programs, wilderness areas, comprehensive land use, bikeways, greenways, heritage areas, land management, rails and trails, open space, wolf and bear reintroduction, conservation easements, and many more. Each of these programs is designed to make it just a little harder to live on the land, a little more expensive, a little more hopeless. In reality, the process is simply hurting people off rural land and into the human habitat areas of cities. And that leads us to the second path, the sustainable development called smart growth. They put a line around the city and they tell you no growth can take place outside of that line. Urban sprawl, they say distinctly. They refuse to build more roads as a ploy to get you out of your car and into public transportation, restricting mobility. New highways, they say, are feeders to new development. They even stop the widening of existing roads for the same reasons. So roads become overcrowded and gridlocked, and they blame development. Their new ploy is to force cars to share the road with bicycles. The complete street, they call it. They're so good at these terms. They believe that the harder it becomes for you to drive your car, the more likely you will just give up and take public transportation or ride a bike. In many smart growth cities, new apartment buildings now have no garages and parking lots. We don't want any stinking cars here. Smart growth creates an unnatural restriction on space inside the controlled city limits. So what happens? There's a shortage of housing and prices go up. That means also that populations must be controlled because now there's a shortage of land. That's why kind, compassionate environmentalist Dr. Jacques Rousseau said, quote, in order to stabilize world populations, we must eliminate 350,000 people per day. Sustainables call for an 85% reduction in human population. Now, I made arrangements with Bill when we're done here today. As we walk outside, there'll be containers of Kool-Aid for you there. I want all of you to drink and do your patriotic duty. And I assure you, there'll be no environmentalists in line in front of you. 85% reduction in human population. How are we supposed to do that? Do we use the proven success of the Chinese population uh, control methods of forced abortions and sterilizations? The Chinese, I can tell you, are big supporters of sustainable development, and I'm sure they're anxious to share some ideas on how to get rid of Americans. David Brower of the Sierra Club said, quote, childbearing should be a punishable crime against society unless the parents hold a government license. One sure way to cut the population is to control food production. And I warn you now, beware of the term sustainable farming. Sustainable farming is not organic or natural farming. Sustainable farming is a political and economic control of food production and land use. According to sustainableist doctrine, quote, a sustainable community is one which provides all of its own needs for air, water, land, food and fiber, and energy resources within the confines of its own site. You don't have cars, so you can't get out of town. Nothing is brought in. Everything that you're going to live on is right there in the community. Do you like bananas? Kiss them goodbye, unless you can grow them in your own little community. So, in a smart growth community, Farmland is inside what is now called an urban growth boundary, or a UGB. The use of the now limited farmland is called a food shed or a food circle, and is tightly controlled by what essentially becomes 
community-owned farms, Chinese agrarian village. And farming practices can only follow strict guidelines set down by government bureaucrats that can control not only how you grow the crops, but what crops you can grow. Once again, the only result can be food shortages, higher prices, and sacrifice that will certainly lead to an urgency to reduce populations. Through comprehensive development plans, energy and water use is tightly controlled, and individuals are being forced to live in denser communities that take up smaller tracts of land per housing unit. Planning advocates and government bureaucrats are forcing such planned communities across the state and the nation, and those plans put severe control on private property. The fact of the matter is, there can be no private property in a smart growth community. The third way of sustainable development inside the human habitat areas, our cities and our towns, government is steadily being controlled by an elite ruling class called stakeholder councils. These are mostly NGOs who, like thieves in the night, just show up to stake their claim to enforce their own private agendas. They attend all these public meetings. In fact, they're usually the only ones who do. Real stakeholders, the people who actually live in that town, are ignored. The function of legitimate government, elected government, within the sustainable system is fast becoming little more than a rubber stamp to create and enforce the dictates of these councils. It is the demise of representative government. And the councils appear and grow almost overnight. You'll find watershed councils that regulate human action near every trickling stream and river and lake. Meters are put on water wells. Special action councils control home size, tree pruning or removal, even the color you can paint your home or the height of your grass. Historic preservation councils control development in downtown areas, disallowing expansion and new, and new building. Once the councils are established, it becomes nearly impossible to discuss issues with your elected representatives. Instead, they will automatically refer you to the proper council or administration or department run by unresponsive appointed hacks armed with their own political agenda. Regional governments are driven by the NGOs and stakeholder councils with a few co-opted bureaucrats thrown in to look good. These are run by non-elected bureaucrats that don't answer to the people. As I said, elected officials become little more than a rubber stamp to provide official approval to the regional government. In Chattanooga, Tennessee, the Chattanooga Area Regional Council of Governments, for example, consists of at least six alphabet agencies of appointed bureaucrats. On their own, they have applied for a $2.5 million grant from the federal government's Sustainable Communities Regional Planning Grant Program. To comply, each participating government must sign a memorandum of agreement to develop a shared vision and to develop livable communities and all that that applies, all the strings attached to force them into sustainable development policies. The people of Chattanooga have no idea that this has been done and they have no say in the outcome. 16 counties and all of the municipalities that they contain will be constrained by this grant application and the 40-year regional plan it produces. Yet just these bureaucrats did it on their own. These non-elected councils fit almost perfectly the definition of a state Soviet, a system of councils that report to an apex council and then implement a predetermined outcome. Soviets are the operating mechanism of a government-controlled economy the exact opposite of our constitutional republic. And the fourth path to sustainable development, as I mentioned, public-private partnerships. You hear the propaganda of the public-private partnerships nightly on your television as their commercials just keep telling you, go green, go green. The truth is, there would be very little legitimate green industry, if not for the billions of dollars in grant money shelled out in the partnership to develop alternative energy schemes. In fact, wind energy may well be the least sustainable and least eco-friendly of all electricity options. It probably requires 
more energy to manufacture, haul, and install these monstrous windmills with their transmission systems than that windmill will create in its history if the wind's blowing and it's turning. Yet the nation, in the name of sustainable development, is investing everything in our future to enforce windmills over real energy producers. Alternative energy amounts to less than 1% of our energy needs. And for every green job created, two in legitimate industry are lost because of green rules and regulations. America has now discovered that it has a near infinite amount of shale oil in literally every state. Rather than celebrate our good fortune to reduce gas prices and eliminate dependency on foreign oil cartels, the sustainablists are rushing in a near panic to block the drilling of shale oil. They will do this everywhere prosperity pops up, everywhere alternatives pop up to their plan, they will rush in and work to stop it in the name of protecting the environment. Moreover, recent government reports show we have more than two trillion barrels of untapped oil under American soil, untapped and banned because of sustainable policy. And now, there is a new kind of corporation being developed through public-private partnerships. It's called benefit corporations. Imagine a legislated brotherhood of business where favored businesses get to go to the front of the line for permits, licenses, and opportunities merely because they agree to advance the principles of sustainable development and Agenda 21. Six states already have benefit corporation legislation. Hawaii, Virginia, Maryland, Vermont, New Jersey, and New York. And five more are in the process of making part of their state corporate legal systems, including California, I'm surprised they weren't first in line, Colorado, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina. This policy will destroy free enterprise and guarantee that we cannot stop Agenda 21. Many Americans ask how dangerous international policies can suddenly turn up in local government, all seemingly uniform to those in communities across the nation and around the world. The answer? Meet ICLEI, a nonprofit, private foundation dedicated to helping your mayor implement all of these policies. Originally known as the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives, or ICLEI, today the group simply calls itself ICLEI, Local Governments for Sustainability. I had to get that word international out of there. In 1992, ICLEI was one of the groups instrumental in creating Agenda 21. It then made it its mission to implement Agenda 21 worldwide, and it's having tremendous success. ICLEI is now operating in more than 1,200 cities around the world, 600 of them in the United States. The group is shooting for 1,000 members by the year 2015 in the United States. Each of these cities pay dues to ICLEI to receive its programs. When local governments contract with ICLEI, they agree to implement the Agenda 21 policy of sustainable development. Here's just some of the programs ICLEI provides cities and towns in order to spread their own particular political agenda in the name of community services and environmental protection. They come in with experts who bring in software products and uh, associated training, access to a network of other experts, newsletters, conferences, and training workshops, toolkits, online resources, case studies, fact sheets, policy, and practice manuals to do with all this is that they are fully indoctrinating your employees down at City Hall to only think of sustainable policies. They set the, the agenda, they set the how much energy should be used, what it takes to cut the carbon footprint in this community. They set all of those quotas. That's what they're doing with it. And then they give them the big one. Notification of relevant grant opportunities. That's the important one, money that comes to your community with severe strings attached. These grant programs were basically written under the guidelines 
set up by the NGOs to make sure that once your community takes that grant money, the strings attached will enforce Agenda 21 in that community. For example, and they keep telling us, none of this has anything to do with the United Nations Agenda 21. Get this. Here's a direct quote from the EPA concerning one of its own grant programs. This came out of the Federal Register, by the way. Quote, the Sustainable Development Challenge Grant Program is also a step in implementing Agenda 21, the Global Plan of Action on Sustainable Development, signed by the United States at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. All of these programs require broad, require broad community participation to identify and address environmental issues, end quote. As they tell you, if these policies have no ties to the UN or Agenda 21, how do they explain that? But keep in mind, your community does not have to be an ICLEI member to be affected by Agenda 21 and ICLEI policies. Around the nation, ICLEI partners with other established organizations like the American Planning Association, which is becoming one of the worst of the organizations promoting Agenda 21 and the International City County Management Association, or the ICMA. And then there's the Renaissance Planning Group. These groups, and hundreds more like them, are all over the country in various sizes, work hand in hand with groups like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the National Governors Association, the National League of Cities, the National Association of County Administrators, and more that your locally elected representatives probably belong to. That's how these policies quickly spread across the nation as enforced regulations. And here are some of the results of these efforts. Across the nation, state legislators are passing laws requiring cities and towns to establish comprehensive development plans that include the high density urban development areas, controls on energy and water use, controls on transportation, making it more difficult to drive your cars, perhaps forcing acceptance of light rail and high speed trains. These laws are now being used as a weapon to force sustainable development at a rapid pace across the nation. And here's some of what you can now expect from these plans that your city fathers say will make things better. One of the most popular tools now to control energy use is the energy audit and building review. They establish quotas. Where did it come from? From ICLEI's plans that they brought into the city. They establish quotas for electrical use and for heating and cooling pumps and water use. That means that government bureaucrats may well now come into your home or your office building and determine the amount of potential energy you should have. Now you'll be given a list of recommendations necessary to bring your home into compliance. It starts with recommendations. It's all voluntary until the city starts to really ramp it up and suddenly it becomes a rule. You cannot have more than this. These may include, on your home, a new roof, new energy efficient appliances, new windows, things like that, to bring your home into compliance. In Oakland, California, the city council did just these things. And the result was an average cost to every single homeowner of at least $35,000. And if you don't comply, you will be fined and possibly unable to sell your home until you do. As groups like ICLEI and the American Planning Association guide the process, voluntary guidelines announced to reduce energy use quickly become mandatory regulations. And how do they control energy use? Well, here's one way. Across the nation, I'm sure you've heard, power companies in partnership with government planners are forcing the use of smart meters. These meters contain RFID chips. The technology enables the power company to keep tra uh, track of how much power you are using and then control, regulate, and ration your use of that electricity. They will set the temperature in your home. And if they decide that you're using too much hot water for your showers or your washing machines or too much air conditioning, your electricity may well be automatically turned off during peak power usage. One reason for that, one main reason, other than the fact that they've set the goal that we're going to cut back our carbon footprint so far, is that they're bringing alternative energy, windmills and solar, onto the grid. It is unstable. When the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, there's no electricity coming out of these generators. 
more and more of these being brought on the grid means in high peak usage, the grid is going to collapse. So they have got to control your energy use. So because they've decided to bring these stupid alternatives onto it, you have to suffer for it. There's now growing evidence that the smart meters are causing medical problems for some that are affected by the right radiation from them. This is leading to a growing opposition to the meters. But those who protest that such meters are a violation of their private property rights and freedom of choice are told that their only choice is to accept the meters or have no electricity to their homes. I love this one. In Naperville, Illinois, where 16 residents refused the meters out of 275 that were targeted in the neighborhood, the response from the Naperville city government wasn't to listen to the people and say, well, let's take a look at this. 16 Amer Americans said this is our property. Now, the Naperville city government is now sending police escorts to accompany the installers to make sure they don't have that kind of problem. And it just keeps getting worse. There are now policies being advocated to place taxes on the use of toilet paper and on the number of miles you drive, not just taxes on the pump, the gasoline. We're talking about a meter in your car that every year when you get your car inspected, they will read that meter and you'll be sent a tax bill for how many miles you drove. This is a major piece of legislation now being considered by the Obama administration. The EPA is now funding, uh, providing funding to NGO groups to run training programs for people to photograph and report neighbors who may be committing crimes against the environment. Last year, Obama signed Executive Order 13575 to create the White House Rural Council. The council is a list of the most aggressive agencies and departments of the U.S. government. It will bring an army of regulators into rural areas to completely control every decision of land use, farming, and development. I find it interesting that part of this council includes the Department of Homeland Security, the State Department, and the Department of Defense. Farmers who have been feeding America for over 200 years will not be able to make a single decision without permission and massive paperwork from bureaucrats from at least 25 agencies, lapping and overlapping and overlapping again, time and time again. Several cities are now taking grant money to create a plug-in development program using your tax dollars to assure the city is ready for electric cars. The program openly admits that it's all necessary because otherwise people won't buy plug-in vehicles. Yeah, people don't want them. Just ask Chevy how the Volt's doing. At least under the free enterprise system, the oil companies paid for their own filling stations while free Americans made their own choices as to what car to buy. Welcome to the utopia of sustainable development. Are you excited? This is Big Brother at its worst. And it's planned, control, enforced by your local leaders and representatives in partnerships with groups like ICLEI, an organization whose vice chairman, Harvey Rubin, said, quote, individual rights will have to take a back seat to the collective. Let me ask you this. Would any of your elected representatives openly admit to enforcing communism in your community? Of course not then why are they so eager to be in partnership with an organization which does? The United States is not part of a global village. We are a, a nation of individuals. We don't sit back and wait for government to be handed down, rules and regulations to be handed down to us by elders from on high. We're a nation of individuals whose rights are supposed to be protected and guaranteed by the representatives that we elect. We demand accountability from them. However, global forces which do not accept the unique American form of government sneak behind the curtain, avoiding controversy and honest debate. The only possible result can be tyranny over a powerless electorate stripped of their rights, their property, and their self-determination. Global warming has been the excuse for the hysteria, but true science is now showing that to be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on humankind. 
So there's no need for these dire policies to cut back our carbon footprint to, by forcing us to lock away land and resources and live in high-density cracker boxes. We all want a clean environment. However, what we're objecting to here is not environmental protection, but the process that's being used in its name. Again, it starts as, at an international level, created by ideological zealots working hand-in-hand in hand through massive international gatherings sponsored by the United Nations. At those massive meetings, documents are carefully prepared for the signatures of leaders of every nation, including the United States. Once signed, the bureaucracies of our federal government use documents like Agenda 21 as a blueprint for legislation and regulations. To write that legislation, the bureaucrats work hand-in-hand hand with the same NGOs who wrote the UN documents in the first place, and then those sanctioned UN NGOs, such as the Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy, team up with groups like ICLEI and the American Planning Association to apply pressure to make sure local city councils and county supervisors toe the line. The resulting non-elected councils and regional governments, unelectable and unanswerable to, to no one, is the perfect definition of a Soviet, a centrally controlled economy. And I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot restore our unique American Republic if our communities are little Soviets. Nor can we protect the environment if our economy is destroyed and free men are unable to make choices other than survival in a sustainableist tyranny. The sustainableists are using our carbon footprint as a measure of our guilt. One fact is sure, if you have no carbon footprint, you are dead. Elected officials can no longer play ignorant about the origins of their policies. America is dying while they're denying. It is their elected duty to represent the people and protect them from these piranhas who are destroying our way of life. To save it, you and I must take action now and understand that the main battle to stop Agenda 21 and sustainable development is being fought not in Congress, right here on the local level. We must stand up and protest at every city council and county commissioner meeting, at every planning board, and, every, and attend these consensus meetings. Don't let them get away with that on their own. Fight the creation of non-elected councils, commissions, or boards because they can and they will be used as a weapon against your ability to deal and reason with local elected government. Above all, refuse federal or state money or new sustainable programs and get rid of the old ones. And if ICLE and the American Planning Association are running things in your town, throw them out. Stop payment of dues, disband anything that they have built and start looking for some high grade tar and feathers. <laughs> and if your elected representatives continue to ignore you while playing footsie with those leading this tyranny, then you must force them out of office. Your survival depends on it. Nameless, faceless bureaucrats wielding power in the back rooms, untouchable and unseen, is not freedom. The sustainableists now haunt the upper levels of the federal government, our state houses, and our city council chambers. In these very dangerous times, it is easy to despair over our nation's future. They have achieved many of their goals, but they have not yet won. Their whole agenda is built on a house of cards that stands only when you are ignorant and compliant. And their arrogance and their impatience to force the policy into place is resulting in a stir of the American people. We are beginning to move the rock of freedom uphill. We are on the threshold of great change because the word is quickly spreading about Agenda 21. After 19 years of issuing warnings about Agenda 21, finally, opposition is being heard. In the past 18 months, the following communities have taken official action to revoke their contracts with ICLEI, starting with Carroll County, Maryland, then Amador County, California, then Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, then Edmond, Oklahoma, then Las Cruces, New Mexico, then Spartanburg, South Carolina, then Albemarle County, Virginia, the home of Thomas Jefferson, 
then Lexington, Virginia. We can now add Carver, Massachusetts, Pinellas County, Florida, Garland, Texas, Sarasota, Florida, Florida County, Florida, Abington, Virginia, Clayland County, Washington, and Chatham County, North Carolina, Monmouth County and Somerset County, New Jersey, and most recently, College Station, Texas, the home of Texas A&M. And we can add to that, Irvine, Texas. Irvin? Irvin? I'm sorry. There's no G on it. Anyway, Irvine, Texas. All have voted to rescind their memberships in Italy. In fact, we believe at least 60 communities have pulled out of Ickley since January 2011, with only 17 new communities becoming members. That is a net reduction of 43 communities, and I don't think we're counting for all of them, because every day I hear another message. Ickley itself now only lists 550 where it used to have 650. And I get reports every day of major battles being fought by activists against Agenda 21 policies. Just last week, I received an excited email from activists in York County, South Carolina, that their county council had voted four to three to abolish their already prepared 500-page unified development ordinance that Ickley had helped write. All of these communities have taken the first step in ending Agenda 21 in their community, but it is only a first step. Getting rid of Ickley means you shot a fired a shot across their bow. All of the policies are still there, all of the agenda is still there, and you need to take it down step by step. But it is a start, and it gets better. In Florida, the state legislature has passed and the government, governor has signed legislation to repeal smart growth legislation. That means that now counties are free from state mandates. They can still do it if they want to, but they're not mandated to do it. This is landmark legislation. In New Hampshire, two bills are before the legislature. One prohibits any state or local government entity to give money to Ickley. Essentially, it bans Ickley. I got a, uh, an email from the legislator who introduced that just two days ago, and she said that it is now passed the House of Representatives in, in uh, New Hampshire, and it's on the way to the Senate. <clears throat> The other bill before the New Hampshire legislature prohibits state and local government agents from entering private property without the written permission of the property owner. Yeah. Private, I'll say it again. Prohibits state and local agents from entering private property without the written permission of the property owner. Now, Senator Rand Paul has introduced a bill, S2122, designed to rein in the power of the EPA and the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And in that bill, he has the exact same language that federal agents cannot enter private property without the written permission of the private property owner. <laughs> Protection of private property is the key to stopping enforcement of Agenda 21. In April, both houses of the state legislature of Tennessee passed an anti-Agenda 21 resolution. It's not binding, but it's a statement nonetheless. Now, I understand the governor, the Republican governor of Tennessee, refused to sign that resolution. Pressure has got to be put on him to, to show that he is standing against the will of the people. But still, the legislature went through the process. That means the legislature is aware, and that is a statement that we cannot deny. Legislators in the state of Wisconsin are working on a bill similar to Florida's to free counties of mandatory comprehensive development plans. The uh, le legislator, who, she introduced a bill earlier that uh, was not good enough, and, and the bill died. She has agreed to work with us so that she gets the proper language this time. And finally, on January 13th of this year, the Republican National Committee unanimously passed a resolution entitled Exposing United Nations Agenda 21. tell you, that is helping in a big way to bring formerly reluctant Republicans into our fight. Revolution against sustainable development is taking place in every corner of this nation. In a panic 
ICLE, created by the United Nations, is now rushing to cleanse its website of any mention of the United Nations. The American Planning Association, it's kind of gone the way of Obama's birth certificate, I guess. <laughs> the American Planning Association has organized a boot camp to train its people how to counter our efforts. What I love about this, I sit at home every once in a while and I just get a smile on my face. We are this ragtag little band that has no money, has no political power, supposedly. And these guys have massive war chests and massive influence, and they are panicked by what we're doing, and they're changing their whole game plan because of us, and I couldn't be happier. <laughs> an, an, APA, an APA, American Planning Association memo says, quote, given the heightened scrutiny of planners by some members of the public, what is said or not said is especially important to building support for planning. What is not said? Don't tell them this. So, they have dropped the main words of Agenda 21 and are replacing them with a George Orwell type newspeak designed to lull you to sleep. And here are a few of the words they are now telling their people to no longer use because it makes us see red. Direct quote. These words, facilitate, regionalism, smart growth, stakeholders, sustainability, government of councils, eminent domain, and mixed-use development. It's just, just a very few of the words that they, they are not going to use anymore. And this is what I love. They caution their people, quote, avoid talking about or linking plans and planning with regulatory matters. My friends, planning is nothing but regulatory matters. Of course, they aren't changing any of the words, or any of the policies, they're just changing the words. And this just in. You all know that next month, there is, they've been planning for a couple of years to put together Rio Plus 20, the celebration of the 20-year anniversary of the creation of Agenda 21. And they've had big plans to put together a treaty that this time will make it law, and all the world leaders will come there and sign this document. This is the purpose of Rio Plus 20. Well, this just in. News leaking from behind the closed doors of the UN Preparatory Committee for Rio Plus 20, the group responsible for providing the finished global plan of action, which has been titled, are you ready? The title of it is, The Future That We Want. We should buy them rattles. You know, little things. This document is in big trouble. For weeks, they have failed to reach consensus on the final agenda that the world leaders are supposed to approve and adopt. Apparently, it's not the future we all want. In short, the Rio Plus 20 conference hasn't even convened, and already it's in trouble. Who said world domination was easy? Well, my friends, we obviously have a very long way to go. I have no illusions about that. But for the first time since I started down the road to expose Agenda 21, I believe if we stay vigilant and vigorous, if we refuse to hang our heads in despair, we will succeed in crushing it. You know, recently I watched the, the film Robin Hood, the, uh, the latest one starring Russell Crowe. And as I watched it, I was struck by the similarities between the people of England in the 13th century and the forces of tyranny that we face today in America. It was a time of serfs who had no rights, no property, and only poverty in their future. It was a time when the king owned everything from land to livestock. And it was a time when tax collectors could literally confiscate everything you had in the name of the king, leaving you with virtually nothing. In 13th century England, the people attempted to rise up and free themselves of the shackles of the king's government. All they wanted was the ability to benefit from the fruits of their own labor. What a concept. The people knew what they had to do if ever they were going to be free. The slogan under which they organized was, Rise and rise again until lambs become lions. Today, 
As we face an ever-growing tyranny by a Congress and a President, as well as elected officials at every level, who lie to you and deny their actions that you can plainly see and ignore you, Americans, for the first time in our history, face the same evil those Englishmen faced so long ago. But in their desperation to complete their agenda, they have pushed too far, too fast, and they have exposed themselves. For the first time, the average, pe average people can see the raw power grab, and it's leading to their undoing. And so, for the first time that I can remember in my long fight for freedom, we are winning battles. We've established a beachhead. We are on Utah Beach on D-Day, and we're moving inland. Do you know how long it took the forces of freedom to destroy the invincible Nazi juggernaut once we had established that beachhead? Less than a year. Our enemies are terrified of us because deep down they know their plans are evil and doomed for failure. Their entire plan is a lie built on a house of cards. And like global, the lie of global warming, it can and it will crash overnight. Their only hope is that we are ignorant, pliable, and afraid to stand and fight. So it's time to stop accepting defeat. Stop looking down at our shoes in despair. Believe in the ideals of freedom because they're right. Now is our time. Rise and rise again until lambs become lions. Thank you very much.